Welcome everyone. It's great to have you all here at uh, this for IP Council's webinar called Navigating Intellectual Property in Sustainable Fashion. My name is Claudia Tapia. I'm the president of for IP Council and I will be your host today. As you might know, for IP Council is a not-for-profit research organization focused on the link between intellectual property rights and innovation. Our mission is to identify and produce, you know, very important topics. So we look at producing empirical research by collaborating with a variety of academics, experts, IP organizations, and other stakeholders. On our website, you can find a vast selection of free materials, for example, studies, summaries of relevant papers, podcasts, interviews, and recordings of our webinars. We also produce easy to digest content at the four SME Kuna, specially tailored for non-IPR experts, SMEs and startups. I'm taking the opportunity to announce our new section at 4IP Council called IoT and Cellular Standards Made Simple, where you can learn about the role of cellular standards, in particular 4G and 5G, in the success of the Internet of Things, how the, inter uh, the interaction works and the benefits across different sectors. Check it out to learn more. You can now follow us on X, LinkedIn, YouTube, and Instagram. Our handle is at 4 IP Council. There you can find out about IPR news, resources, interviews, and future webinars. And without further delay, it is my pleasure to introduce our speakers for today's webinar, Professor Rika Wenenstein, and Fernanda Donaire Bassoni. Ulrika is Vice Dean for Education at School of Economics and Management at Lund University. And she's also Associate Professor in Private Law at the Faculty of Law of Lund University. Fernanda is an IP and IT attorney with seven years of experience in the private sector and academia. She is currently the head of coordination for FOIP Council. You can find the full biographies on FOIP Council's web, uh, website under webinars. And each of them has conducted research on the topic of today, which led to at least two excellent papers. Uh, one of them uh, has been written by Fernanda in co-authorship with Maria Elena Desco. And it's available at Fora Council. The title is Fashion, IP, and Sustainability, Best Practices, Interaction, and Strategies. And you can find it in the research section. And Rika, maybe uh, in the Q&A time, uh, while you're not presenting, you can write uh, the, uh, the name of your paper, even if it's only in Swedish. I'm sure some of uh, those joining us will be interested in knowing about it. And a final remark for the audience, please do not hesitate to use the Q&A tool to submit your live questions. You can find it in the lower part of the screen and you can raise your questions at any time during the webinar and the questions will be addressed following the presentations. So with that, Ulrika, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, and thank you for the uh, nice introduction and for being a, a guest here today. Thank you so much. So um, I will actually talk firstly, uh, I will talk about new business models and IP. I will have two examples of reuse of, of fashion, but I will start off earlier than that. So I will firstly go to the European Commission that actually adopted a new circle economy action plan 2020. However, I think the importance of IP and how IP legislation can contribute to these changes has been neglected in this plan. But to be 
able to actually explain my point of view, I would like to go back in history to a long time ago, to the uh, uh, second industrial revolution. S started in the end of the 19th search century, also known as the technical uh, revolution. It was a massive technological advancement and it was helped by new sources of energy as electricity, gas and oil. And between 1870 and 19, almost all industrial nations enjoyed booming economies that led to dramatically lower consumer pricing, resulting in greatly improved living conditions, and at this time, we had the linear model of production that was dominated the economic system. And as you know, the linear economy is based on take, make, and dispose. And it, I think that we should note then that both the Paris Convention and the Bern Convention was actually adopted in a time where the linear economy was dominant. But now we are in a transition. We're in transition from the linear economy towards a circle economy. But a circle economy is not that easy to explain because it don't have any clear definition. Sometimes it's used as more an umbrella for both circle economy and sharing economy. And I think that we must then be very careful with the words because circle economy is actually a system where the products of today are at the end of the service life into resources for, for others, closing the loop in the industrial ecosystem and minimizing the waste. Reuse is often discussed in connection with the circle economy because reuse increases the capacity utilization of the products and increased capacity utilization often leads them to, to reduced production. But it's not necessarily to circularity. If circularity could be completely achieved, materials should become new products without any environmental impact. Sharing economy is then something that you could say rely on extra sharing and lending instead of owning. A European Commission defines this as business model where activities are facilitated by a collaborative platform that create an open marketplace for the temporary usage of goods and services often then provided by private individuals. Of course, it could be also companies. So it seems like with more sharing, fewer pro products are needed uh, to service the same number of people and, and demand for production in input is reduced. But there is actually a lot of criticism when it comes to business models as sharing economy because it's not sustainable per se. Sure, it will, will be lesser products that are used more, but they will finally be waste and are not closing the loop. So uh, even if they are quite often, I mean, advertised with cut waste, save money. So uh, now I will reflect upon these two business models from an IP perspective that actually enhances the use of products, but might not be circular because it's more in a sharing economy that's actually a part of a linear economy. So I will uh, first look at my first business model that is a uh, library of things. What is this? You lend or hire, exam for example, fashion products instead of owning. It can be, of course, clothes. It can be shoes and accessories. It's not only this. It could be also uh, camping items or party items or whatever. But now we're talking about fashion. There's different types of arrangement when it comes to these, this business model. It might be a membership fee or a daily and monthly fee per item, or a model where it costs a certain amount, for example, five, 10, 15 pieces. And the more you lend, the cheaper it becomes. Or it might require some sort of, of membership, 
where the cost depends on the item selected. And there are also models where the user only pays one time sum up on use. And there's also business models where you actually better describe it as a some sort of subscription uh, uh, services. But all these kind of, uh, all these uh, library of things are relying on intellectual property exhaustion. The principle of exhaustion, and as you know, was established several decades ago and is based on the balance between intellectual property protection and free movement of goods within the union under the article 34 and 36 of the Treaty of the Function of the European Union. So if we first look at these lending libraries, uh, the lots, when it comes to copyright, we have the right of distribution that says that the author can prohibit any form of distribution to the public by sale or otherwise, and that this right is exhausted in respect of the original copies of the work when the first sale or transfer of ownership in the community is made by the right holder or with his or her consent. In the InfoSoc directed recite 28, it also says that the distribution right of, of uh, is without prejudice to the provisions relating the rental and lender, lending directive. Rental is actually something that is making something available for use for a limited period of time for a direct or indirect economic commercial advantage. So if we look at Article 3.2 in the Rental and Lending Directive, the exclusive right of distribution includes rental and lending. But however, buildings and applied art might be rented out without the right holder's permission. And fashion, at least when it comes to haute couture, <laughs> I would say, is actually a, a work of applied art. And so that's why the definition of what is a work of applied art will be of importance as this can be rented out without the permission of, of, of the copyright holder. Then we move on to the trademark. Uh, we will come back to that because we will hear also Fernanda talking about the exhaustion right when it comes to trademarks. And here the important is that is actually a limitation in Article 15.2 where the, the exhaustion shall not apply where there exists legitimate reason for the proprietor to oppose further commercialization of the goods, especially where the condition of the goods is changed or impaired after they're put on the market. But here we have a situation where actually lending original goods and they are not in any way changed and so on and so forth. So this would be okay also. Then we have the design, right? We have the community design regulation that gives the design holder an exclusive right to use the design and to prevent other parties from using. The, then we have to look, look of course, of the definition of use. The article says that it covers, for example, for example, or in particular, making, offering, putting on the market, importing, exporting, and using, and so on and so forth. It doesn't say anything about lending and rental, but as the notion is actually use, I would say that Article 19 is covering also uh, rental and lending. And we have the exhaustion of rights in Article 21 that relates to the scope of protection. So that will be no problem either. And the same when it comes to patents. The use and cir circulation of a product which have been put on the market of the, by the patentee or third party acting with the consent of the patentee cannot be prohibited by the patentee. So my conclusion when it comes to library of things, it's not such a big uh, IP problem when it comes to fashion. Right? It can be when it comes to other copyright work, but not work of applied art. So let's move on to the next model then. And that is upcycling. What is upcycling? Creative reuse, redesign, upcycling, remake. It's a form of uh, where you actually reuse this material and products and add value through a creative process. 
In many cases, I would say that uh, recycled materials are used. For example, you you use an old towel or a curtain or a rug that can become uh, new clothes. In other cases, uh, you you use more um, famous brands and products and you try to, to alter them or reuse them. But like the library of things, the admissibility of creative reuse is mainly based on the applicability of the possibility to have the exhaustion of rights. So we'll come back to it again. It's almost a, some sort of a repetition. But when it comes to copyright in this case, I would say, when you try to re, uh, reuse a copyright protected product, then you have the genuine product, the right is, is as we have concluded, exhausted. But then, of course, we have the Alposter case, the C41913, that says that exhaustion will not cover when the work has undergone any alteration of its medium. And here, in that case, it was a transfer of the reproduction from a paper poster into canvas. There can also be problems when it comes to moral right, because moral right, where you can actually then object to any distortion, mutilation, other modification, or the the uh, derogatory action of the uh, work, that is actually against the honor and repetition of the uh, author. And finally, when it comes to copyright, of course, they can be also seen as an adaptation or a derivative work. But here we have a problem because this is not harmonized within the EU. But in many countries, you have to have the permission of the copyright holder unless the change is so big that it's actually it's becoming a new work. So if we move on to design right, we have already talked about this. Um, so we again have an exhausted product. But if the exhausted product is altered, what, what happens then? Of course, it's only the original product that's put on the market that are actually is exhausted. We have no EU cases on this, but we have a case from the Bundesgerichtshof in Germany. There was a, about a, a car, a Daimler car, and they added a new uh, section. And the court concluded that the effect of exhaustion of right under Article 21 related to products which had actually been put on the market and not to some of their characteristic. If the infringing product, like in this case, clearly deviate from the standard version of the car, which have been put on the market, the exhaustion of right do not affect the right to prohibit infringing design. So as soon as it's changed, it might be a problem. And the same goes to patent law. Here, we draw a link between repair and recreate the invention. Repair is not infringing, but if you recreate the invention in a way that is actually fall under the scope of protection of the invention, then, of course, it will be an infringement. So here you can see we have bigger difficulties, and you have to assess it case by case. And now I will give the floor to Fernanda that actually will continue to talk about trademarks and upcycling. Thank you so much, Erika, and thank you so much for the introduction, Claudia. Uh, so I'm going to talk a, a little bit about... Just, just a second, I apologize, because uh, someone is mentioning that they cannot see the slides. I can see them. Uh, I'm not sure if there's only Jenny having this issue. If all others are having the same issue, please uh, share with us. Uh, but for now, I can see the slides, so let's hope. Everybody else can. Thank you, Fernanda. Apologies for the inter interruption. Please go ahead. No worries. I'm, I'm going to talk up a little bit about upcycling and the possible uh, a possible trademark infringement. So uh, starting with the basics, what is a trademark? Uh, a trademark is a sign that allows us to distinguish the goods or services of one company uh, from those of other companies. It is an intellectual property right, and it can be registered to ensure its protection in several different countries and jurisdictions. Um, when we are talking about 
trademark infringement in relation to upcycling, we are talking about a product that has been modified and it's bearing an, an unauthorized use of a trademark. Um, a key factor here is if uh, the situation, in this situation, the product can cause confusion among the average consumer, leading them to believe that the product uh, is produced or somehow connected to the trademark owner. Um, this is particularly concerning for brands that are well known for their quality or production processes, uh, because if these products can be perceived with an inferior quality or um, and, and be associated with the, the trademark owner, it could possibly harm the reputation of this brand. This is why upcycling is so delicate when it comes to trademark use. Um, the easiest way to avoid trademark infringement when you're using recycled material is to remove the original trademark from it. And another way is to get authorization from the trademark owner, but we know that this could be quite challenging, uh, especially uh, inside uh, big companies that have uh, compliance and internal procedures for this type of uh, uh, projects. Um, so that actually leads to my next slide, which has two images here. Um, these cases are from the United States, but they, they can paint a very good picture of how confusing upcycled products can be for consumers. Uh, at the top image, uh, you have products that reuse materials from a very famous fashion brand that perhaps wouldn't be able to confuse uh, a consumer who is familiar with, with the products of this brand, but it could possibly be confusing for the average consumer or someone that uh, hasn't been intro uh, introduced to the brand yet. And in the image below, we have upcycled products from another very well-known uh, French brand, which reused uh, buttons bearing the, the trademark of the original brand, which could also leave consumers in doubt if this is an original product from the brand or not. I tend to say that when it comes to fashion um, and you're not in the industry, everything is possible and this could be perceived even as um, a sustainable initiative from the, the brand even. Uh, so the message here would be uh, for designers of upcycled uh, products to be <clears throat> as transparent and clear as possible in order not to cause this confusion. Um, this could be through advertising, uh, disclaimers and any other means that would make it clear that they are not connected to the original brand. But still the trademark owner could have a legitimate reason to oppose uh, that these products would be commercialized. Um, being clear and transparent can mitigate that risk, but it doesn't eliminate it. Thank you. Thank you to both of you. And I remind everyone, if you have questions, please use the Q&A uh, section. And until we receive them, uh, let me start with you, Rika. Um, I was wondering what changes in the IP system do you think are necessary to transition from this linear economy you were mentioning, this make use waste, to a circular on a sharing economy? Firstly, I think that uh, we have to um, go through the entire IP system because it's actually, as I said, made in a time where we had the linear economy and that was the basis and we were thinking about this take, make, make and, and dispose. And if we are going to transition to another kind of economy, we really have to think it through again. 
and then I think it's but we we also I think have to so both when it comes to the uh, the rights how you frame the rights but also when it comes to exceptions and limitations I would say Apologize, I was muted. Uh, was important, I was saying. Uh, but let's imagine fashion were to a greater extent not sold, uh, so not transferred to of ownership, but render as services in a service economy. In this case, which amendments uh, to IP laws will be needed? So I think when it comes to, as my conclusion, when it comes to the library of things, if it's first sold once, uh, then of course it, the, the, there will be an exhaustion of rights. And as I can see, it's, we don't have that much of a problem when it comes to work of applied art, uh, at least in copyright. So in copyright, we have problems when it comes to other kinds of work, but not work of applied art and, and not buildings. Uh, when it comes to design, no problem or not so big, much big problem and, and also uh, trademarks and, and, and patents. So in that case, I maybe don't see a, a real need to make big changes if you don't want to start renting out other things like artworks, um, uh, films and uh, so on and so forth. But then we move away from fashion. So uh, so that is something, but otherwise I think more important changes, more near important changes before we actually go through the whole system is actually to have exemptions when it comes to protection, for example, of spare parts. We should look into that. Should we have these kinds of, of protection for spare parts? And also, a possibility for people actually to a right to repair. I think a right to repair is something that would be needed for uh, extending the lifespan of a lot of products uh, where you are not infringing if you actually are, are, are repairing a, a product. Because sometimes today it's not that clear if you have to like make something to fit to the, this product, it might be that that part is also, as so we have today, for example, in copyright, it's so small parts that it will be protected. So in that case, it would be hard to make smaller things that have to fit uh, as we don't have this, or we have it in the, in the stock direct, but I don't think that so many countries have actually used the repair uh, exemption. Mm -hmm. And I saw before Fernanda also nodding. Uh, but I was thinking in this, um, you know, a sharing economy is not by default sustainable. And considering this, can IPRs contribute to innovations in sustainable business models? I think absolutely IP can contribute. Uh, I think that when it comes to uh, um, the these plans on 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 the European uh, level, maybe we have it think through the IP system how it can contribute uh, as much as we could, because for example. I think that the IP system, as it had contributed to a lot of other sort of, I mean, uh, contributions when it comes to other sort of inventions and so on and so forth, that actually could be make make a better world. Um, different kinds of green textiles and new types of textiles and so on and so forth. So I think so, but it has to go, it has to tangle with... <laughs> With, with other kinds of rules also. So that is a very important. Mm -hmm. Fernanda, anything to add? Yeah, if I could add, um, I think IP uh, plays a role in fostering innovation. Uh, so protection, your inventions may encourage investments in new 
sustainable technologies. And this is important because research and development uh, costs a lot of money and for, is essential for the development of new technologies. And I also believe that IP can enhance collaboration towards uh, sustainability. Um, for instance, let's think about patents uh, through licensing agreements. IP rights can enable uh, the sharing of knowledge and technologies between organizations, fostering uh, cooperative efforts towards sustainability. Hmm. That's interesting. Usually the IPRs are very linked uh, with these excluding others, and it's great to see that they are way to to the um, these other the other other parts of the IPRs. I have one question here in the uh, Q and A. Uh, what are the, your views on the infringement of the copyrights in the case of fashion products? Uh <clears throat> I will start. I don't know if Fernando wants to continue, but I will start. I think when it comes to IP and fashion, we have some problems with this uh, uh, fashion paradox uh, that actually exists. Um, there's a lot of written about the fashion paradox. And, and when it comes to fashion, I mean, Copyright is not, I mean, the main way to protect, I would say, because then it has to be really something more extra, even if the threshold today is very low, the author's own intellectual creation, free and creative choices, and, and the personal reflection in, in the work. So it's not very high threshold, but still it's higher than in design law. Uh, I think the problem when it comes to fashion and the fashion paradox, if you don't know the fashion paradox, is more like in fashion, you want to be followed, but you don't want to be copied. <laughs> so that is something that's really interesting that you are, I mean, if, if you don't set a trend, you are not that important. So you must be able to set a trend, but of course you will not be, be copied. So that's why I think that our um, the solution in, in, the, in the European Union, where we have the uh, possibility to have uh, uh, unregistered design protection for fashion for three years, as soon as you make it available to the public, I think that is a brilliant way to solve it. Because then you actually get your protection for the fashion product, it just have to be 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 new and different from previous designs, and still you have your three three years, and you have it for just yes, for for copying, and that was most fashion designers' needs. Mm -hmm. So so in that case, uh, but if of course I I mean, as I am an, an IP lawyer, I don't like infringement. That that's for sure. <laughs> Fernanda, anything else? No, I agree with Ulrika, and I really like the fact that she brought up the, the fashion paradox. Excellent. So you mentioned one of you at least, uh, upcycling, but can you elaborate? What is upcycling in the fashion context? Okay, if I may start on uh, this one. So uh, upcycling in fashion typically involves uh, taking uh, clothing or old pieces of uh, textiles uh, that are no longer in use and modifying it either to repair a piece or to create something new. Mm -hmm. um, we have seen some examples of this. And I was wondering which steps could upcycling designers take to avoid infringement? Um, I think when it, as I said, when it comes to upcycling, I think it is not that easy as is it when it, when it comes to the, the, the library of things, because there is always a possibility that you actually will infringe. Um, 
because extortionate right is actually only for the genuine products. Um, and when it comes to design them, if you look at the design protection, there is a risk that you actually are infringing. And um, I also think that when it comes to, for example, uh, we can we can debate that, Fredan but when it comes to uh, trademarks, I think the the the, um, the Mitsubishi case on debranding is a bit problematic when it comes to also um, if if you put that in 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 connection with circle economy, because if there could be also an infringement to actually debrand, then it's not enough to only take away the the, um, the the trademark. So, yeah. And I think that was quite, at least to me, a surprising decision. Mm. Fernanda, you, you were mentioning that at least there could be a way to minimize certain risk and in order to make sure consumers are not misled into thinking this is the original brand. Uh, what would you recommend? Uh, I would recommend it's in the line of, of what I said on my last uh, slide. I think this is very much related in how um, new designers and uh, people who are doing uh, upcycled products advertise these products. Um, and this is something that can confuse consumers and let them to believe that there may be a commercial relationship with the original brand. Um, one simple example that I can think about is uh, when a store or maybe a website have the disclaimer saying uh, authorized seller. So uh, in this case, you would have to have a disclaimer, unauthorized seller, or we are not connected to the brand. I think that would be uh, making it clear, being transparent is, is a way of trying to avoid it. Hmm. So that could be a way to minimize at least. Uh, Rika, we have seen, I would say in the last years uh, intensively, that has been a, a change in IP regarding the importance of balancing intellectual property rights against fundamental rights. And this we have seen it in the cost of, of the vaccines, um, sustainability could be maybe in the future, uh, will we reach a point where we balance IP against uh, sustainability? I surely hope that this will come uh, soon <laughs> rather than later, <laughs> because I think that, because when I think, or when I went to law school, there was never ever any discussion about having to weight IP against any fundamental rights. So there's been a change in that, I would say, but that change has taken quite a lot of time from maybe the nineties up until till, till, till now, or some sort of development in, in almost like 20, 30 years. And I think when it comes to, to sustainability, to weight um, intellectual property towards, or balancing it towards then uh, sustainability, I think that we have to move faster because now, in, in my opinion, I think that we are in a, in a climate crisis, so we have to move much faster. We can't, I mean, we can't have this in 20, 30 years. It has to be go faster, in my opinion. What do you think, Fernanda? Um, I I agree. Um, I think it has to go. It has to go faster. So maybe we have here decision makers. <laughs> 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 so why are luxury goods typically used for reutilization and repair in singular fashion? If I may start on this one, um, 
because uh, I believe that usually uh, luxury items uh, are made from uh, good quality and more durable materials. So they are um, a, a good material for upcycling, reutilizing, uh, and repairing it. But if I may add, I also think that when it comes to this luxury, I think that if if you can also, I mean, alter, if it would have been possible to even have the uh, trademark still in, in place, a lot of people like these kind of goods and, and I think it has, I mean, a value, even if it's change and that could even be something extra because then you have something else that someone else don't have. So, so that can also be something that it's of importance. You can see that they are using, I mean, shirts, for example, and keep the trademark and then uh, are, are changing it with other kinds of sleeves or whatever. And then pro suddenly you have a unique product from, from that brand. <laughs> Exactly, unique from unique, <laughs> very special. In that case, because you, you were mentioning, um, we need to move faster. So Rika, if you could change only one aspect of IPLO to promote a more sustainable fashion industry, what change, what concrete change will you propose? The right to repair. The right to repair. <laughs> Can you elaborate a bit? I'm not sure if everybody <laughs> here uh, understands. Uh, I can ask it has to do with the right to repair without infringing, but yeah. where, where is the limit? Uh, can anybody uh, repair to without any limitations? How will you create that? Um, I think uh, as at least, at least as a private person, you should be able to, to repair the things that you actually have uh, or bought, uh, that would be uh, an immediate, I would like that to be an immediate change. Um, always be possible. But of course, these companies that then will help repairing uh, might, as today, uh, infringe. So, uh, of course, there will also be so even if it would be like a, a private copying, that would be like a private right to repair, but still you have to have this company that actually can help you. I'm not really sure how that would be framed, but I think it's uh, <laughs> it's a possibility <laughs> to think it out. <laughs> and we can work on it. But what about... Um, Sorry, it, Cla Claudia, you, you mentioned uh, a limitation and I... I yeah, something crossed my mind. Uh, I think uh, the limitation would be when there is any proprietary um, a piece of a technology from a company that helps diagnose a problem um, in a car, for instance. Um, I think that is the limit. Um, how can we access that without infringing? uh their their rights mm -hmm. what about if i'm um in a company that is helping someone to make changes but then i want to do business out of it instead of doing for private use would that be also within the right to repair if i'm for maybe confusing even the consumers and they think they are um buying the brand and also maybe for the image from the brand itself. Maybe they have decided they didn't want to create certain products. And then with this transformation, new items are created that are not aligned with, with the vision of the company. Would that be included within the right of repair or that would be rather not included? In, in my point of view, I mean, I think the most important thing is the right to repair, the private right to repair. And uh, then if we should have uh, other kinds of changes, I think we have to really uh, 
uh, make a thorough investigation to see what effect it would be on on the market so that that would be more uh, later on or, or or firstly we have to really think it through sounds good since we are changing the law here then <laughs> why not uh, we have a key question which is do you think that exhaustion need to be expanded for more circularity I don't know. Um, when it comes to uh, exhaustion, I think that today uh, still for copyright and design and patent, I don't see an immediate change. Uh, maybe when it comes to trademark, because there is still some uncertainty in at least in my opinion, because you have that extra layer that you actually can hinder exhaustion if the, the product is altered and so on and so forth. Um, so, um, yeah, um, the change that might be discussed, we could discuss is more if it could only be the genuine product or if of course, as in, in trademark, it could be an alteration to it, to it. So that is the thing. But otherwise, I, I don't see an immediate um, on top of my head. <laughs> Very good. What is a legitimate reason a trademark owner might oppose the resale of goods? Um, I think uh, this is related to exhaustion, and this is a case-by-case -case analysis, which also depends on the jurisdiction. Mm, one example I can think regarding European jurisdiction is uh, serious damage to the reputation of a brand. Rika, anything else? Yeah, or if you, I would say also, if you if you think there is actually some sort of economic uh, relationship between the companies, so you actually confuse them, that you think that, oh, this was uh, interesting that they have now started to modify their products in that and that way. And it's actually genuine products that are, 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 are bought and then they are uh, altered. And you think that... Uh, now they have started to do this kind of new design and so, so forth. And they think there is a link or there is a license or anything. That is also a problem, I would say. Mm -hmm. Fernanda, in which scenario could an um, cycle garment be considered a different product? So um, upcycling is a term that is also used in the fashion industry uh, for repairing goods. So in my opinion, it would be considered a new uh, good or a new product if there is a significant change in its appearance or functionality. Mm -hmm. mm. Maybe a question to both of you. What does de-branding mean and why is it a concern for trademark owners in the upcycle context? Do you want to start, Fernando, or do you want me to start? <clears throat> you can start, feel free. Yeah, it's more like de-branding, actually, when you remove the brand from, because one can think that if you, if I just, like, remove the brand, then it's not a problem anymore, because then the product don't have any brand on it. So then, it, of course, it cannot be trademark infringement. And I think that, um, at least in my opinion, I was thinking in, in those lines before the, before the uh, Mitsubishi decision. But after that decision, I think it's not so clear anymore what, what even if you have a de-branding, 
it could still be uh, an, an infringement. Um, so that is something that you also have to take in, into consideration. Yes, I, I agree. And uh, defending consistent removing an original trademark and, and adding another one perhaps and uh, it, it it's not clear anymore if it's uh if if it's an infringement or not mm -hmm. because for example when you uh, when you upcycle there is different kind the of way of course you can you can still have your brand on uh, or, or you can have the original brand on and then you can add your own brand so you have two conflicting conflicting brands uh, or you can remove the original brand and put on your own brand or only remove the brand. So there's different way to to uh, to to make this approach in an in upcycling world. A lot of possibilities. We have another question from the audience. Uh, we are trying to understand the difference between recycling and upcycling. Could any of you elaborate? You want to elaborate, Fernanda? So upcycling is more like you try to, in my point of view at least, uh, you try to recreate uh, or you, you, you change the product in a way to make some sort of creative value to the product. So a new creative value, maybe as you, we could see in, in, in your slides, for example, I take the bottoms from, from a, a famous brand. You have, for example, a jacket, and then you remove the buttons, and then you make, for example, a jewelry out of the buttons. Still, you have the brand on. And that is a way to be creative uh, and use old material. When it comes to recycling, that would be more into uh, how you uh, avoid, I would say, waste. So you use all the material again in a way that you try, as I said, to close the loop entirely so we don't have any waste. And, mm -hmm. and, and that is not really the same thing because there you don't really have to have any creative input. It just that you have to use, for example, the textile to something new, but it doesn't have to be anything creative at all. Maybe you could do something else about it with it. I don't know. Mm -hmm. As a as a general lead designer, is it a good practice to ban photo clicking of my design generally instead of getting IP protection on the same? And if someone infringes, can I get some protection on it? That has been raised here in the in the chat. Um, I'm not entirely sure what what it's meant by a uh, photo clicking on my design. Um, but as a a uh, um, I would say as an IP. Uh, scholar, I would say IP protection is always good to have. <laughs> I mean, I think that uh, that is a way to uh, protect yourself always. Um, yeah. Yeah, indeed. Because afterwards it's getting more difficult, exposed, so to say. So as we are approaching the end, I'd like to invite our speakers both of you, to contribute at the last thought or message. Please, in one minute, for our listeners to take away from this webinar. Ulrika, let's start with you. No, I think my message is uh, that I think that it's time to rethink IP and its role in transformation from the linear economy towards the circle economy. And uh, I think also that we have to try to find new balances between IP and other so so social interest. In, in this case, it would be then uh, 
sustainability. Thank you. And I take from you this right to repair. <laughs> so, Fernanda, what about you? So, uh, firstly, I would like to uh, thank uh, Maria Elena Aldesco, which wrote uh, the article with me. She was not able to participate with us today, uh, but she was a, a huge part of our, our final uh, article. And um, th my last message is for uh, trademark owners uh, to promote practice, uh, uh, upcycling or secondhand markets uh, with internal uh, upcycling initiatives, or uh, we have seen uh, collections uh, of sneakers only done with materials recycled from previous collections. So I would like to see more of that from, from uh, luxury brands or big brands. Mm -hmm. So let's hope we have more collaboration and more openness to to open doors for new designers. And I think as user, that could be very interesting to, exactly. to at least have observe in it. Uh, but um, before we close up, uh, there's a very quick question of someone raising, uh, which decision were you talking about uh, the branding? Not sure who was talking about core decision? It was Ulrika. I, I know it's related to Mitsubishi. Um, I don't know the other party. Ulrika, if you could, if you remember that. I tried to find the case number now on the Mitsubishi case. Uh, okay. Otherwise, maybe we can post it later on. Yes. I can't find it immediately now. Maybe we can add it when um, yeah. or when we upload the webinar. So the recording will be in our website so we could make also the, the reference. And um, again, you can find the uh, the article from uh, Fernanda in our website for epicouncil.com in the part of research. And uh, Ulrika, we will also need to have the reference of your article and then we will also add it. Uh, when we upload the webinar. So you will I can just add the case number now. It's C12917. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> thank you. And, uh, yeah. And thank you so much. This has been a very interesting discussion. But unfortunately, it is time now to conclude. And thank you very much, Ulrika and Fernanda, for sharing your knowledge and expertise and Thank you also all of you for attending this webinar and participate and raising such interesting questions. A recording of this presentation will be made available on the Forty Council website tomorrow. And please do not forget to sign up to our newsletter to find out uh, about future webinars, new research papers, podcasts, and more. You can use the QR code that you see on the screen and to go straight um, to the sign up form. And finally, I would like to remind you that tomorrow you will receive an email inviting you to complete a one minute survey about this webinar. And we will be very grateful for your feedback. Thanks and goodbye.